In this episode, I'd like to introduce you to a group of Iron Age kingdoms that emerged in what's today southeastern Anatolia and northern Syria following the Bronze Age collapse of the 12th century BCE. They're called Neo-Hittite kingdoms or states because many of them continued or imitated the cultural, religious, and political traditions of the once powerful Hittite Empire. If all this sounds interesting to you, stick around. First though, let's do a quick review of what the Old Hittite Kingdom was. What we call the Hittite Old Kingdom started with King Hattushili, who rebuilt Hattusa, a once prosperous city that had been destroyed and cursed several decades before by another king, Anida of Kusara. Hattushili liked the location though, and made Hattusa the capital of his new kingdom. In fact, the name Hattushili means Man of Hattusa. Anyway, during his reign, he expanded the territory of his kingdom to occupy large parts of Anatolia and what's today northern Syria. His grandson and successor, Murshili I, continued these conquests, including putting an end to the once powerful kingdom of Yamhad and sacking the city of Babylon and eliminating its first dynasty. Murshili's conquests, though, were unsustainable, and eventually, he went back to Hattusha, where he was assassinated. This was also the start of several decades of instability and rule by weak kings. Perhaps the greatest king in Hittite history was Shupilluliuma I, during whose reign the Hittite kingdom, which up until then had been on life support, rapidly expanded once again to become a powerful empire. He took back many territories that had previously been lost in Anatolia, as well as northern Syria, and all but destroyed the powerful Hurrian kingdom of the Mitanni. From then onward until its collapse, the Hittite Empire, along with Egypt, Assyria, and Kassite Babylonia, reigned as one of the most powerful states in the ancient Near East. Kings such as Murshili II stretched the network of Hittite holdings and vassals to the Aegean Sea, while his successors, Muwatali II, fought the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh, and Hattushili III, who though a usurper, was able to conclude a treaty with the great Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II, ushering in a long-lasting peace between the two great kingdoms. Unfortunately, during the reign of Hattushili's successor, Tudhalia IV, things began to go downhill. Though he may have been a relatively strong king, his successors faced constant threats from family members who believed that they had stronger claims to the throne. The end of the Hittite Empire came sometime after 1200 BCE, when the last Hittite king, Shupiluliuma II, is believed to have abandoned Hattusha in the wake of armed militants, who could have either been Kashka from the north, or groups of the bands of marauders collectively known to us as the Sea Peoples. After the dust from the Bronze Age collapse had settled, several new, smaller kingdoms emerged on what had formerly been Hittite territory. As mentioned earlier, many of them continued or preserved the cultural, religious, architectural, and political legacies of the once great Hittite Empire, and so scholars call them the Neo-Hittite states. Now in a recent episode on the Aramaeans, I talked about several states such as Bit Adini, Bit Agusi, Bit Hayani, Sama'al, and others. There are some scholars who also include these as Neo-Hittite states, and many of them actually did start out that way. However, they were eventually taken over by Aramean rulers, and while they may have been influenced, especially artistically, by other Neo-Hittite states and Hittite culture in general, they identified themselves, and were identified by others, as being distinctly Aramean. If you're interested in learning more about those kingdoms, check out the video I did on the ancient Arameans recently. You can find a link in the video description. Though some of these successor states were occupied by Aramaic and Akkadian-speaking populations, most of the rulers and elites of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms used the Luvian language and its hieroglyphic script for keeping records and writing inscriptions on their monuments. As Luvian was the most widely spoken language within the old Hittite empire, many Neo-Hittite kings, who saw themselves as successors to the great Hittite rulers of the past, chose to use it exclusively. In addition, these kings adopted names such as Hattushili, Shupiluliuma, and Muwatali, which were the names of some of the great Hittite kings of the past. 
Of all of the Neo-Hittite kingdoms, the most prominent was Carchemish. Located on the west bank of the Euphrates River, Carchemish had once served as the Hittite Empire's main administrative center in the northern Levant. It also had the good fortune of coming out of the late Bronze Age collapse virtually unscathed. The city may have also had the most direct link to the Hittite Empire of old, since its royal family claimed lineage from the great Hittite king Shupilluliuma I, who had installed his son, Piasili, as the regional viceroy and king of Carchemish in 1340 BCE. Inscriptions found amongst the ruins of the city seem to indicate that his line may have been unbroken for several generations, even after the fall of the Hittite capital, Hattusha. Its first, you could say, Neo-Hittite king was Kuzi Tashub, the son of the last known Hittite imperial viceroy. Luvian inscriptions claim that Carchemish had at least three ruling families, the first being the viceregal dynasty just mentioned, while the other two were the Suhi and Astirua dynasties. Eventually though, Carchemish lost most of the territory that it controlled and was reduced to an independent city-state until the Assyrians absorbed it into their empire in 717 BCE under Sargon II. The city was destroyed in 605 BCE by the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II, though parts of it may have been occupied at later dates. Another Neo-Hittite state was that of Adanawa, also known as Kue in Assyrian texts and located in the land which in later Roman times became known as Cilicia. The site today is known as Karatepe. It's here that a very famous Luvian Phoenician bilingual inscription was uncovered. Known as the Call of Azatiwadas, it was commissioned by King Azatiwadas of Adanoa and probably placed at the gates of a fortress. Part of the inscription reads, I am Azatiwadas, the sun god's man. Servant of Tarhunzas, whom Awarikas, king of Adanawa, made great. Tarhunzas made me mother and father to Adanawa, and I caused Adanawa to prosper. I extended the plain of Adanawa, on the one hand towards the west, and on the other hand towards the east. And in my days Adanawa had all good things, plentiness, and luxury. I broke up the proud and the evils which were inside the land. I moved them out of the land, and I benefited the house of my lord. And every king made me his father because of my justice and wisdom and goodness." He goes on to talk more about his great deeds, but the part I really like is at the end where he curses anyone who should delete his name from this particular monument. If anyone from the kings, or if he is a man, and he has a manly name, speaks this. I shall delete the name of Azatiwadas from these gates here, and I shall carve in my name. May Celestial Tarhunzas, the Celestial Sun, Ea, and all the gods delete that kingdom and that king and that man. In future, may Azatiwadas' name continue to stand for all ages, as the name of the moon and of the sun stands. I suppose that the curse worked, because the inscription still stands with Awatizadas' name inscribed on it several times. Such monumental inscriptions were typical of many Neo-Hittite kings. Other Neo-Hittite kingdoms known to us from various texts and archaeology include Hamath, Tabal, Gurgum, Patin, and Kumu. During the 9th century BCE, the Neo-Hittite kingdoms essentially became vassals and tributaries of Assyria. Though many of them were constantly in rebellion and even formed coalitions with the goal of driving Assyria out of their territories, ultimately, none of them were able to do so. The Assyrian government eventually took away their kingdom status and reorganized many of them into provinces with a military governor at the top. This had the effect of eroding their identity as political entities, and with forced deportation of many of their people, along with others from different parts of the empire being relocated to these once predominantly Luvian-speaking areas, few were left behind to carry on the Hittite traditions that they had clung to for so many generations. Within a short amount of time, what were once the Neo-Hittite states ceased to exist. 
So I hope that this short video introduced you to the Neo-Hittite states and what they were. Thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. If you learned something or simply just enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button because it helps the channel out a lot. Also, check out the History with Sai podcast where I go into more detail with regard to some of the topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Until the next episode, take care and stay safe. <laughs>